I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we'll discuss the siege of Mariupol, the latest developments in Germany's position on the conflict, and I put your questions to our experts. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in fate. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, I sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's April 20th, day 56. And today, I'm joined by Dominic Nichols, the Telegraph's defence and security editor, Francis Sternley, assistant comment editor, and Verity Bowman from our foreign desk. I started by asking Verity for the latest on the siege of Mariupol. So what we're seeing today is that the battle for Mariupol seems to be entering a really crucial peak after months of devastating fighting. So what we've got going on today is the steel plant, as you mentioned, which is sort of the last holdout in Mariupol. Soldiers are saying that they've only got a few hours left before it's taken over by the Russians. We've got a lot of civilians trapped and a lot of work trying to get civilians out. Talking a little bit about the steel plant, what is it and why is it so significant? So it's actually one of the largest steel plants in Europe and it's an entire four miles, you know, square, square miles. And it's significant because it's filled with these underground tunnels and they're actually packed with people. We've got soldiers down there, we've got civilians down there, and it's sort of been described as a city underneath the city. And the issue is that the Russians really, really want this plant because of its strategic significance. As I said, it is the last holdout in Mariupol. So once they've got this plant, they've got the city. But as the Russians are attacking it and trying to smoke people out, you know, there's a lot of people at lives at risk there and a lot of civilians who are in danger. There's been some talk of humanitarian corridors. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? Um, yeah, so Kiev and Moscow have agreed on a humanitarian corridor. They're aiming to evacuate around 6,000 women, children and elderly people. But that is if the agreement holds. Whether it sort of will hold together and whether we're actually going to get these people out is another question. You know, what we've seen in the past is that Ukraine has closed humanitarian corridors because they're worried that Russia is going to attack them. And we've also got to remember, so, you know, it's 6,000 people. That's not a very big chunk of the population in Mariupol that are trapped. We know that it's about 100,000 and these people are trapped in really, you know, in really dire situation. They're living in some of the worst conditions imaginable. You know, over the last few weeks, we've seen bodies in mass graves, them surviving among the rubble and some really severe food shortages. So there's a lot of cravats to this sort of humanitarian corridor thing, but it is progress in the right direction. And just to pick up on a couple of things I've I've got some notes on. Um, Families hiding underground in Mariupol have claimed that the lack of sunlight has been making their children ill. And also Russian forces have been accused of using um, bunker buster bombs. Can you tell us a little bit about this, about these updates? Okay, yeah. Um, So like I said, there are around a thousand civilians sheltering the plant. And we saw video released yesterday and that showed these families that you mentioned that are still hiding out. We saw, you know, very young children, women carrying babies and what they were saying and telling the camera was that their children have been down there so long that the health effects are really serious and they are suffering vitamin D deficiencies, like you said, and the whole situation, you know, it's not like they can last much longer living in those conditions. Um, Yeah, and then going on to what you said about bunker busting bombs, the big worry is that, like I said, they're going to hit civilians in the area because they are used to, you know, penetrate deeper than a lot of other weapons and... They are designed to cause damage really low down, which if we've got civilians hiding down there is a really bad situation to be in, really. Absolutely. Verity, is there anything more you'd you'd want to add that we think we haven't covered before we bring in um, Dom and Francis? Yeah, I think um, one of the biggest developments we saw today is a video that actually came out of the steel plant. And it was a soldier who was saying that they have just hours to live. They said that, you know, the enemy is outnumbering them 10 to 1. And they said, this is our last appeal to the world. 
Um, they said they're facing the last few days in the bunker and that Russians have a huge advantage over them. I think seeing that video, you know, really made it hit home that there are people trapped inside there and that it is a very desperate situation. So I would say if you're more interested in that, we've got an article running on our foreign pages going into that in a bit more depth. Thanks very much, Verity. Uh, Francis and Dom, just wondering if you had any thoughts or comments about that. Yeah, hi, David. Hi, everybody. And the only uh, comment I'd add is it's worth keeping an eye on on our colleague Roland Oliphant's uh, Twitter feed. He makes a really interesting point that um, one of the reasons why the, uh, the Ukrainian fighters in Mariupol are probably very reluctant to take up this offer of of, um, of surrender from the from the Russians and uh, and uh, safe passage as combatants uh, is after the the 2014 uh, Ilovaisk. Please forgive me again. Forgive me my uh, pronunciation, but Ilovaisk massacre in 2014, where um, there was a, a safe passage agreed. Um, after after which uh, Ukrainian fighters, uh, military mil- in military uniform, were fired upon by by Russian troops and uh, and a number of killed. So, uh, Roland just makes the point. He he he's very good. He's he's had a lot of experience on the ground, both now and uh, and in the 2014 invasion. So he's very good at sort of um, putting it into that historical perspective, that near term historical perspective. Um, and so it's just just worth uh, keeping an eye on his Twitter feed. Francis, any thoughts from you? Um, I would just add that, um, to Verity's point, the the video is quite striking. We've seen the same commander in Mariupol make several videos in these last few days um, appealing to the world. And he's actually requesting sort of an extraction from uh, Western powers um, in an attempt to get them out. I don't think there's um, very much, if any, chance of that. Um, I think it's sort of a last desperate appeal, really. Um, but the significance again of Mariupol cannot be overstated as a uh, as a city for the reasons we've talked about um, many other times on this podcast, which is that once Mariupol is taken, um, if it is taken, it seems like a foregone conclusion. I know we've been saying that for more than a week now, um, but uh, it, once it is taken, then a land bridge effectively is formed between the Crimea and the eastern regions of Ukraine. That will make it much easier for the Russians to supply um, and to rebuild uh, it, their forces for any further invasion plans. So um, it, that is the significance of the city and that is why it's being fought over, even though it is now largely a, a shell of its former self. Thank you, Francis. And thank you, Verity, for, for that, uh, detailed, that detailed update. Um, just zooming out slightly from Mariupol, are there any other updates from the rest of the front that we should know about, uh, Dom and Francis and Verity? Yeah, so in the Donbass region, the the attack seems to have started. I think that that's been accepted. We were we were saying yesterday that um, that it's been largely an artillery duel in that area and wider, of course. But in the in the Donbass, this this second phase, alleged second phase, um, seems to be mostly mostly artillery and airstrikes. But it does seem to be there's movement on the ground. There have been there's been pressure in a number of areas just to the northwest of Luhansk, between there and. and um, uh, and up towards Kharkiv from uh, Russia. Uh, the, the town of Kremina has been taken by Russia, although the Ukrainian defenders said that they ceded that ground um, in order to take up a better defensive position. And they also made the point that there wasn't, there was nothing left of the town anyway to hold. So it still seems to be very early days in this phase, this press for the Donbass. Um, but there, there is actual movement, uh, movement on the ground. There's still a huge amount of artillery in the area and and wider. Um, Mikolaev in the south was was hit by a number of number of strikes overnight, for example. But um, but yeah, there is, there is there does seem to be some movement uh, in the Donbass. Uh, continued, of course, to be resisted by Ukraine, particularly in the north, where they're trying to cut just to the east of Kharkiv. They're trying to cut that supply line. There's a very very vulnerable. Um, single access route the the Russians are using to come down from um, Belgorod in 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 Russia over the border and down through uh, Izium into uh, into the Donbass and that area in particular is is they're trying to be um trying to be severed by the by Ukrainian resistance uh, but yes it does seem to be things are things are moving in the Donbass and Francis you had some updates from uh, the diplomatic circles from Germany Yes, well, it's been a very eventful 24 hours in diplomatic circles with regard to the remarks made by the Chancellor of Germany, Olaf Scholz, yesterday. Um, He effectively has refused to join an international coalition sending heavy weaponry to Ukraine. 
And um, as you can imagine, he's come under a lot of criticism in many Western powers, uh, not least um, here and even from within his own country. The justification that he's given for not being part of that coalition is that rather cryptically, he says he doesn't want Germany to, to go it alone on weapons and that any decisions have to be made in, in cooperation with friends and allies, quote. Um, well, the said friends and allies are actually doing quite a lot um, that's been announced in the last 48 hours. So the, US, the UK and the US are prepared to ship NATO standard weapons to Kiev in response to um, to the demands for more firepower from from uh, uh, from President Zelensky, Biden spoke about giving howitzer artillery artillery cannons in the next delivery to Ukraine. The UK is preparing to send storm and missile launchers. It's been reported, which again is much higher level, higher grade weaponry than we've seen previously um, in this uh, in, in this conflict coming from Britain. Presumably, we've been um, we've given them what we've had, and we've been developing this in, in in the weeks since the conflict started. The Czech Republic, as well, is sending. Um, uh, tanks, um, one of the only countries in Europe to to be most uh, openly se- sending tanks to to Ukraine. The Czechs, of course, being part of the former Soviet Union, they know what freedom means, um, and uh, and and uh, have been very vocally supportive. Um, Slovakia, as well, are sending air defence missile systems and are in talk even in sending um, sending aircraft as well. So um, a, a very um, strange situation to to hear Olaf Scholz make. Making these remarks yesterday, um, the thinking that the reason that he has done this is um, again comes back to what we discussed at length yesterday, which is relating to their reliance on Russian oil and gas. Our understanding is that if there is a way in which this conflict can end sooner with some sort of peace arrangement um, between Russia and Ukraine, that the Germans would be in favour of that, even if that were to mean that uh, the Donbass were given to Putin potentially or Crimea as remaining permanently part of Russian territory as some part of some peace arrangement. They want peace as soon as possible um, so that they can then um, resume some some sort of arrangement with with Russia and developing energy and other things, or at least to buy them more time to um, to develop different means of, of of energy production that is less reliant on Russia. But they are starting to feel the pressure um, of of of, of, uh, of the conf- of the consequences of their current energy policy, and it's clearly worrying Olaf Scholz enough not to want to upset um, uh, Moscow. So not a good situation for for Germany to be in, um, and it is, as I say, rather embarrassing, really, from the perspective of, of Olaf Scholz, who only last week came to Downing Street here in the UK and was effectively in conversations with Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, to try and receive um, some support from us, potentially even some energy from us, um, it, it, so to try and uh, lessen German reliance of, uh, of Russian oil and gas um, in, in terms of their, uh, uh, their energy, which is about 40%. So um, just one other remark on this. I mean, effectively, you know, Germany has been struggling for decades now with the guilt incurred by its experience in the 20th century, Um, not just by starting wars, but of course also the genocidal guilt um, triggered by the Holocaust. And unfortunately, the the burden of that has been such that it has been very reluctant to engage militarily um, in any since reunification um, in, in, in almost any areas. Um, it has is, is essentially wanted to be part of Europe, part of the European conversation, particularly economically, um, but it has not wanted to assume the mantle of a kind of leadership of, of, of Europe. Um, in, you know, it has not wanted to be the same that perhaps France and Britain has traditionally in Europe for fear of its um, of its history. It wants to be sort of the quiet man of Europe, if I could articulate it as such. But the problem with that is, of course, is that they have been very naive in their relationship with Russia and are now paying the consequences of that. And of course, this was always a major fear of Margaret Thatcher's. She feared that if Germany reunified, that um, it would become the economic powerhouse of Europe, but would not want the responsibility that came with that. And I think that to some extent, her her concerns in that area have been proven accurate. Um, but as I say, the, the German experience has been one 
of being guilty and about their genocide caused in their name in the in the 20th century um, and yet as a consequence of their their policy unfortunately we are seeing um, similar atrocities committed on European soil and it appears to me that the elite is still in denial about their culpability in that and um, they're going to have to at some point step up and realize that this is now become a black and white issue that um, and I think you know if you look at Poland and you look at Britain and other nations that have, have are seeing it in those terms that if Russia is given anything here um, in terms of, of, of territory that, that Putin can then sell to his people as a victory, that that sends a very, very dark signal, not only to European peace and long term with Russia, but also to other world autocratic regimes. So as I say, it's not a good look for Germany. And I think that, that, that as I say, the elite have not woken up in that country. The people, I think, are starting to stir, but I don't think the elite have. And it seems they're, 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 they're in denial, really. Verity and Dom, do you, either of you have anything to add to that or to come back on any of that? No, I think that's a that's a pretty comprehensive assessment of where we are. I mean, um, I would echo France's point about Germany's naivety, but uh, they're not the only ones there. I mean, there's 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 been a lot of that going around. I don't think anyone else has it possibly to to the same degree. Um, but yeah, we should we shouldn't we shouldn't beat them exclusively for for that uh, for that point. I mean, uh, in the the Commons, the the Defence Select Committee yesterday uh, heard from. Um, uh, uh, former General Barons, Richard Barons, who was saying that we in the UK are just are just not uh, aware of of this threat, or so we've we've chosen to avoid this threat. We've over in the last fifty years, I guess, really, we've just thought that wars happen to other people in other places. It's not. It's never really been a, a, a threat to the homeland. Um, it's been a. It's been an away match. We've sent uh, sent troops overseas to go and do bits and pieces, but we've never really felt an existential crisis. Uh, here or an existential threat here, um, and such we we didn't we haven't responded. There hasn't been the pressure from society through our through our politics as we saw Russia's increasingly um, aggressive and and uncontrolled um, behaviour in the last twenty years. So we, we we've been we've been just as guilty of it. Uh, I mean, General Barron's made, made the point that um, if if it came to a shooting match with uh, with Russia, then. UK is well within range of some of these hypersonic missiles and other missiles short of nuclear. Um, and how how resilient is society? How aware is society of this threat? And if we've had this wake up call from Ukraine, then is there going to be a shift in the public mindset that yeah, many many people think that the defence budget is just is is sunk costs? It's all wasted money, um, or it should be used to prop up the. Uh, to British industry, British defence industry, and elsewhere, and that the defence budget should be some some form of kind of societal welfare, if you like, to keep industries going and and so on and so forth. Whereas now we might actually be faced with no, no, there's a real threat out there if you don't stand up against these um, autocratic capitalist or this autocratic capitalist model that that Russia is exporting China to a certain degree, um, then there will be consequences. Uh, but it's a very very difficult conversation to have with the with the public when they see um, yeah, the amount of money spent on the NHS, for example, uh, but but the public see a very direct uh, link to that, Very how, how much of that is used every single day by uh, friends, family, loved ones, et cetera, et cetera. Very difficult argument to make in terms of security to say, well, we need to spend more money. I'm not going to you know, say the same, same as the NHS or, or what have you, but trying to make the case that we need to spend more money for security and it is something that you use every day, even though you can't you know, see it, touch it, go and, go and walk through the front doors of it. But you know, this idea that security is coming back on the political agenda is very interesting, but there's a huge inertia away from spending more money on that. Um, it's, it's deemed too intangible. Um, and all that feeds into this this naivety that, that we see sort of expressed most acutely in Germany's actions now. If I could just um, comment on that, I think Don makes a really good point about the priorities of perhaps of the public in, in Western nations as opposed to perhaps in, in, in Russia. I mean, just on military spending, obviously um, Britain is one of the very few countries in Europe that is spending 2% of its GDP on military. Um, I think the Russians spend around 50 to 60%, depending on how you calculate it. So it just speaks to the difference in priorities there. And as, as Dom says, I think the West has been very naive um, because, of course, this is another important point, is that when one is spending those kind of numbers, the uh, inclination 
motivation to fight and to be militaristic is much greater in a country that is, spend, is spending that much and has that many soldiers. Um, but just one other point on this nu- nuclear and, and, and hypersonic missiles. Um, this is very relevant to us. I was having a, 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 a conversation with somebody a couple of weeks ago that was making the point that let's say that things had escalated a little bit further um, um, when the conflict started. Remember that Putin was making remarks about um, effectively threatening the use of, of nuclear weapons. He didn't quite express it in that way, but I think we all knew what he meant. Let's say that things had escalated very quickly then, and of course this conflict is not over, it's, it's not impossible that, some, that, 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 that a similar incident would occur in the future. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, he, he, he drops a bomb somewhere that's uninhabited to make the point that he's not afraid to, to use these kind of weapons, or, God forbid, he uses it on Kiev or something like that. Overnight, the entire political... Um, and military consensus, if that's the right word, in Europe would be utterly transformed. And just to give a sense of quite how quickly things would spin round, people will recall that with COVID, you know, what began as being a sort of an issue in the background, within about two weeks, you suddenly have the prime minister on television giving a a statement telling everybody to to remain in their homes. It doesn't take long when there is a crisis for things to completely flip the other way around. And and you can imagine a situation where Vladimir Putin, if he used one of these weapons or if he threatened directly one of these weapons and the West suddenly really did believe that he might use it, you would have leaders of Western countries, including Boris Johnson, no doubt, saying, here's what you need to do. We don't, we, you know, we hope that this is all just rhetoric from Russia, but as your leader, as a responsible government we need to inform you about what you should do in the worst case scenario you know we're not it's not that far away if that were to occur and as i say i don't say this in in in, in, in any um, anticipation that it will happen i think it's very highly unlikely but i just use it as, as an example that we have to be aware that we are part of this and these are real conversations that need to be being had it's deadly serious and um and, and i just i I'd urge people to be sensitive to the fact that things can change so quickly and 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 just think back to the, to the start of the coronavirus pandemic and the lockdowns. It didn't take long for the whole world to change overnight. Thank you very much, Francis. Um, Verity, I've j- just had a, 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 mess, a message and a question for you, thinking about um, what's happening in Mariupol and um, the developments there. The question is basically asking, how, how, do we, how do we know what's going on? This is, this is the hottest part of the war zone. Um, I'm... I'm We've got shells and ammunition flying overhead. The battle is ongoing. What what kind of sources are you finding, and how and how are you getting get, getting to the source of what, of what's going on? Um, so as we found for quite a while in Mariupol, it is extremely difficult to find people on the ground that you are able to contact. So I do have I mean I am in touch with one girl who you know has sporadic contact with her mother, and I'm able to speak to her through her daughter. But other than that, it is quite difficult to find people on the ground now. A lot of people have left when they could. A lot of people just don't have phone signal. So sort of what we're using at the minute is the social media that we do have access to. So like the video I mentioned earlier of the soldier speaking from the tunnel underneath the power plant, he had posted it on Telegram. So we're able to use a lot of different Telegram channels to find out information from soldiers and from sources that are on the ground. And, you know, social media as ever, you know, Instagram, Twitter, we're able to find a wealth of content there. And we also have people who are on the ground, so journalists that are able to feed again onto Twitter and sort of get what information we can from them and verify it in however we can. And just a question from me, if that's all right. Obviously, at the beginning of this conflict, Verity, you were writing quite a bit about social media and its impact on the conflict from sourcing stories to looking at how di- di- dif- different the different sides are using it as a as a propaganda tool um looking back over the past 6 weeks what do you think anything has changed i think people on social media are very desensitized to the content we're seeing so in the beginning tiktok was this huge arena for the war it was causing a lot of people to panic we were watching a lot of videos of military equipment moving in and we are seeing a lot of those videos still and we are seeing videos of people who are fleeing the conflict But definitely, you know, the people that are watching these videos have become quite desensitised. And I think, as Francis said, we might have lulled ourselves into a bit of a false sense of security with it. Um, And in terms of Instagram and talking to people on Instagram, it is still possible, like it was at the beginning of the conflict. 
um, in a lot of places, you know, not in Mariupol, but in Kharkiv and Kherson. So we're getting some good information from there, like we did at the start of the conflict. Thanks, Verity. Uh, Francis, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts or qu- questions to Verity about, about Mariupol, considering, considering that's the sort of the big story of the day. Yeah, if I may, please. Um, Verity, have you got any feel for, um, for, the, for the location of the Ukrainian fighters and the, and the civilians? Because as, they, as the Ukrainian fighters, to my mind, as you, Ukrainian fighters have quite naturally wanted to provide um, shelter and protection to these uh, to the civilians, are they not then in a dan- in danger of being either labelled um, by the Russians as using them as uh, human shields, or how are they able to to get sufficient geographic distance from them such that they are they are not drawing more danger towards them if they are continuing to fight? Um, they're, they're not inviting reprisals against the civilians themselves. I mean, it's, it's a it's an awful position to be in to to want to continue to fight against the Russians whilst also providing protection. But, I mean, uh, do you have a feel for at what point they need to say, look, we, we can continue fighting and we want to, but we are just becoming more of a danger to our own people if we do so? Are we, are we anywhere near that yet? I think we might be nearing that um, part of the conflict, especially if you consider the steel plant and the people, the civilians that are hiding alongside a lot of soldiers underground. And they are, you know, in the direct line of fire. And as you said, Russia could turn around and say that they are using these people as a human shield because, you know, they don't want to use these. Well, they do, but it is a difficult situation to be using these bunker um, bunker busting bombs when they know that civilians are down there. And, you know, we could be seeing the use of chemical weapons. That's what a lot of experts have said, sort of to smoke people out from underground. And, you know, these civilians are alongside these soldiers, so they are being put in a difficult and dangerous situation because of their proximity. And what we're actually seeing in the capital is quite unclear at the moment. You know, the movement of Ukrainian soldiers, because it's difficult to see what's going on there, we're not certain of it. But it definitely is the case that a lot of these civilians are in the firing line. And, you know, Russians could quite easily turn around and say that they are using them as a human shield. Thanks, Verity. Um, I, th- I think a couple of other updates would be good to talk about before I've got some questions, of some other questions from from listeners. Um, it was announced this morning that Wimbledon tennis tournament uh, are banning Russian or all, all Russian players taking part, and the Russians have reacted to this. Francis, do you want to comment on this? Yes, I mean, it, 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 in contrast to, to Mariupol and some of the other topics that we've spoken about today, not least the, the nuclear issue, it seems rather a small one, but I think it speaks to something that's much larger and, and more significant on the strategy in inverted commas for for um, for this conflict from a Western perspective. But yes, just coming to the facts at hand first, as you say, Russian and Belarusian players, um, significant, obviously, Belarusian because of um, the dictator there's alliance with, with Putin, uh, won't be allowed to compete at Wimbledon this year because of the invasion. That includes, of course, the world number two in men's and the women's number four. Um, They have been allowed to compete on the tennis tour up to this point, but not under their national flags. But obviously this is going one step further in an attempt to isolate Russia from, I suppose, the the broader international community, which of course extends to to sport and other matters. I I recall that when the conflict started, the Olympic Committee um, said that they made some very condemnatory remarks and and went further and said that uh, I think they were receding several... um, uh, sort of initiatives that the Russia were able to be part of because, as I say, sport is, is now, see, there's, they've got this sort of concept of the Olympic truce, which is meant to be used to help and try and broker peace and ensure peace around the world. And obviously by doing this, Russia has, has broken elements of agreements they've made with the Olympic Committee, hence why they, they uh, um, were willing to condemn them. But as I say, the All England uh, Lawn Tennis Club are going to confirm this. We expect today that they will not be allowing the Russian and and Belarusian uh, players um, to compete. Um, The reason that I think it's worth just discussing this, as I say, is because the issue here is is to what extent do you blame the entirety of the Russian people, who, of course, we've spoken many times, are are the victims of a ruthless propaganda machine, um, and, and and to what extent do you blame the the sort of dictators and the the, the kleptocracy in those countries? Um, 
there will be some, of course, who are listening, and I, I sympathise with this argument very much, that, that the most important thing is to isolate Russia diplomatically and, 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 and culturally from, from the West to send a very clear message to the Russian people that this will, if you want to be part of the world, that you are, your country, your leaders are not able to get away with this. However, I do fear on the other side, and I'm sure there'll be other listeners who agree with this argument more, which is that by isolating Russia, by creating it, making it into a pariah state, more of a North Korea, that actually that plays into the narratives that, that the Russia, ha, the Russian dictatorship, have essentially been um, uh, parroting since the beginning of this conflict. That essentially this is a Western conspiracy. That there is Russophobia um, throughout the West, and that this is just an excuse and an attempt to uh, bully and and uh, and. Uh, ruthlessly condemn the Russian people um, and that that in some way will bolster the Russian regime. And just a, a comment on, on these tennis players ex, ex, um, explicitly, I don't believe they've made any real public remarks that have been sort of pro-Putin. I think one of them's called for peace but hasn't gone any further than that. Um, so, you know, there is another question here, which is, are these the sort of people that actually we should be extending our hand to and saying, look, you know, you're somebody who is not just in Russia, you're not just hearing the, the Russian propaganda. We want you to come and we want you to, to use your platform to perhaps to, to, to highlight what's going on here and say that there, are mo there is more to Russia than just the dictatorship of Vladimir Putin, that there are Russians who um, are trying to, 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 to offer an alternative. Um, so, as I say, I, I'm not pitching an argument one way or the other here, but those are some of the, the, the issues that are relevant to this and some of the arguments that are being made around this issue. And there'll be some who will, be, who will agree very passionately that this is the right decision by Wimbledon, and there'll be others who, who think it's the wrong one. Um, and time will tell, of course, but um, it, it, as I say, it speaks to a much broader issue that the West is grappling with and something that the world is grappling with about the extent of Russian isolation. Thank you, Francis. Um, and finally, just before we go to our questions, um, well, finally, from my perspective, there might be more notes that Verity and, and Dom have that you want to comment on. But Boris Johnson, the British Prime Minister, is off to India this afternoon. I think it's important to touch upon this, maybe just briefly, um, as he just, you know, he's seen as one of Zelensky's most prominent uh, and best allies. Um, he's facing some trouble at home. Uh, and that might be affecting um, some of his involvement in the Ukraine war. Francis and Tom, can we comment on this briefly? Why is he off to India and what does he hope to get when he's there? Well, I'll happily cover it very very briefly. Um, as you say, Boris Johnson is, a, is at home, uh, take, 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 <coughs> excuse me, facing considerable um, uh, criticism at home uh, of late around um, the Partygate scandal. Um, the, we understand, and I don't believe that he's actually going to India in an attempt to deflect from that. This apparently has been in the calendar for, for some time. It was delayed and postponed due to the pandemic and then other factors earlier this year. Um, the reason it's relevant to Ukraine is that we've spoken in the past about India's very strange stance on this issue. Of course, they are reliant um, more on trade with Russia than um many other democracies around the world, and they have abstained in several significant United Nations votes condemning the Russian invasion. So I think the way to read this is um, uh, whilst uh, Boris Johnson is it benefits to some extent from from perhaps uh, from being away and not having to face the criticism in the House of Commons um, during Prime Minister's questions and the like. At the same time, this is actually is, is much bigger than that um, because we hope and understand that that that, that the British government will be basically appealing to. Um, to the Indian government to do more in its condemnation of Putin. Johnson has been quoted as saying that, you know, we as we face threats to our peace and prosperity from autocratic states, it is vital that democracies and friends stick together. India, as a major economic power and the world's largest democracy, is a highly valued strategic partner for the UK in these uncertain times. And he said that he's going to deliver the, that, that, that message to India and its people. So, uh, as I say, that the reason this is relevant to Ukraine is this is an attempt by Western powers, of which, as you say, Boris is, is considered now one of the sort of world leaders over the issue of Ukraine and, and, and the broader existential crisis threatened by the West, is an attempt to bring back into the into the into the fold those democracies um, that have been perhaps more aligned with Russia than we would expect and we would like, and to bring them back into into a. 
uh, being more perhaps on the side of of the West and, and of the de- democratic values that we that we hold. So I think that's the real significance of, of this here. We obviously, I imagine there'll be some talk about trade deals and the economies and job creation and things like that. But in terms of Ukraine and foreign policy, that's the real significance of this. Thank you, Francis. Uh, Verity and Dom, any thoughts on that and anything we haven't mentioned that you think we should? Well, just on India, the other the other thing to, to be aware of is that, of, of course, we can't turn our back on the, the, the rising challenge from China. And um, for all the differences we have at the moment with Narendra Modi's administration in, in India, um, not least of which is the, the, the links to Russia right now, but we have to we have to maintain those, those very strong historical ties we have in, in South Asia um, against against the the increasing uh, belligerence from from China. So I think that there's there's also that. I mean, it's very helpful to Boris Johnson to get out of town right now, um, especially today. But uh, but yeah, and there is the immediate concern of, of Russia. But in the background, there is there is the um, the, the the sleeping dragon. Thank you, Dom. Uh, Verity, anything else we should mention or think about before we move on to our questions? Well, I think, you know, we can't really, going back to the steel plant, we really can't understate the significance of what's going on there. It is, you know, it would really damage Ukraine economically because steel contributes around 12% of Ukraine's GDP. So this is really part of Russia's sort of deliberate, systematic destruction of industry in Ukraine to bring it to its knees. But, you know, it's for would also rem- reward the Kremlin with control of a land corridor stretching to the Crimea Peninsula. So as soon as this steel plant falls, you know, Mariupol has fallen and we've been seeing that develop for months now. So if that happens in the next few days, it is going to be a hugely significant part of this war so far. Thank you very much, Farrisi. Um So we've got a couple of questions I thought would be um, useful to cover. Um, this is from uh, Colin, who who writes that he sees that Russia seems to have some success targeting ammunition stores and military repair sites. Um, he wants to know how serious a setback is this? And also, how do they actually know where the sites are? Is it common knowledge? Is Can you work this sort of stuff out from Google Maps? Might there be potentially Russian uh, moles masquerading as Ukrainian uh, workers sending info back? Um, Tom Nichols, could you throw some light on this? Yeah, hi. Well, thanks, Colin. Thanks for the question. Um, I think I think you raised a really interesting point there, and I I'll, I'll sort of come I'll start at the end if, if you like. I'm just surprised that there haven't been more of these attacks. So these these sites are um, are fairly well known, as in they are they're military barracks or in, uh, the whole industrial military industrial complex should be should be very well mapped by Russia in Ukraine. They should have been mapped for years, and they should be updated. Um, you know, GPS locations, satellite, all the rest of it. These sites should should all have been mapped. They should all have been known about, um, and they should all have been hit by precision guided munitions very early in the war. The fact that so little of them have been, I think, uh, just adds to this this idea that that Russia really haven't prepared for this war very well, or or uh, took the massive assumptions that they were so much better than they've proved to be and Ukraine will be so much worse than they've proved to be. So the fact that they, that these sites have uh, not just sprung up out of nowhere, um, they should have had, uh, they should they should have all been wrecked by GRU or, or other organs of the Russian state for years. We've spoken since the very first days of, of this war about how Russia would want to find uh, and and attack the supply lines coming in to the west of the country from from NATO members and, and other countries coming over the border of the neighbouring countries, and um, and it's it's a little bit similar here. Now you, there have been a huge number over four hundred diplomatic expulsions of Russian um, uh, from Russian embassies around uh, around Europe and uh, and elsewhere. Now they may have been the undeclared intelligence officers that we would expect to go and find these these supply lines. Um, but quite why there haven't been other people for years dotted about Western Ukraine, um, locating the, these sites, mapping them, photographing them, et cetera, et cetera. I, I just find it, I find that extraordinary. And it just suggests to me that, as I said before, that they, they haven't, they're just not very good. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, I can think of this and I, I, you know, I didn't do <laughs> brilliantly well in my my military career and I, I can work this out so why they haven't I've just I'm just staggered but but Colin I, I mean if you look at it look at what what Ukraine have been doing with these small potentially soft special operations forces raids when you look at the 
the air assaults into Belgorod, into that oil facility and, and the logistics facility a few days before that. If you look at how um, train lines in Belarus and, and across the border in Russia have been have been attacked. Um, look at the attack on the Moskva, which was sunk last week. I mean, these are these are these are the complete opposite of what Russia has done. Russia's just tried to grind its way through with, with massive firepower, killing, uh, indiscriminately killing people in its way and just smashing the place up. Whereas Ukraine's been quite, um, it, it's used its force, what little limited force it has, very well indeed. And it's used these on these um, sort of out of area ops, if you like, for, for great effects, not only for, for tactical military effect, but also for information effect. So, I mean, this is not new. These, they, they should have worked this out. Um, these sites shouldn't still be standing. They should have all been hit uh, early stages of the war. Um, and I, I just, it, it just staggers me that Russia had not prepared well enough. Um, they've, not, they've, not, they've not looked at this side of it um, as, they, as they have done. They've just relied on, on, on brute force and it turns out quite a lot of ignorance. Thank you very much, Tom. And finally, we've got a question from Bradley, um, I think, I believe, in, in Poland, who is asking us to talk a little bit about the population resettlements conducted by the Russians. He says, in some Polish news broadcasts, I've heard that Russians have already resettled as many as 800,000 Ukrainians inside of Russia. Um, he's aware of some sim similar sorts of operations conducted by the Tsarist and the Soviet um, embodiments of, of, of the Russian state. Um, this is a story which has, which has been around for a few weeks now. Um, Francis Verity and Tom, what do we know for certain about this? Uh, well, like you said, this story has been around for a few weeks now, and we do know for certain that some civilians have been taken from eastern Ukraine and have been, you know, had their papers taken off them, have their passports taken off them, and they have been forcibly removed. They've been put onto buses. I think we saw it in um, Kherson, you know, which is the biggest city to have been fully taken over by the Russians, and we have seen it in Mariupol. And they are sending these um, people, you know, to far-flung areas of Russia. We've had reports of them being sent um, as far as, you know, as sort of leaning on the Pacific. And, um, you know, it is a long way for these people to be going and it is happening a lot. But sort of what's been happening in recent weeks, I'm not as up to date on. Francis, I don't know if you want to comment on the, the historical um, parallels here. Yes, well, uh, as Bradley points out, this is not a new strategy, for us, but as far as the Russian state is concerned, many, whenever one talks about moving people east to Siberia and the like, um, we know obviously that in much of Russian history, those who get to sent, be sent east are people who are enemies, in inverted commas, of the regime. And um, just to speak to, I think there's an interesting point to be made on the gulags generally, which is that they are not part of, I would say, the collective cultural memory in the West in the same way that um, the death camps in Germany and in Poland and elsewhere from World War II are. I think there are a couple of reasons for that. I think one of them is, of course, that the gulags were largely erased after... Um, uh, they were out of use, so we haven't got that sort of linchpin of, of, or in very few instances have we got a linchpin visually of what these places looked like. And they were truly horrific places where millions of people were worked to death, and I mean that literally, um, worked to death. And some of them didn't even need to have guards on them because you, uh, the, 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 you know, there was nowhere for people to go. You know, no, they, they just it was a wilderness, and and you knew that people wouldn't survive. Now, I'm not saying that these people who are, who are being uh, sent there now are going to gulags or similar, but I'm just talking about the policy of resettling people who might cause you problems um, is something that is is not a new strategy um, in in the Russian toolkit, as as, as Bradley points out, um, horrific though it it may be. Just on the on the issue of how we know this, um, because Bradley talks to why this isn't being reported so much in the West. Um, it is being reported, but I agree it's perhaps not getting the same now of provenance. That's because we don't necessarily know as, as, as much as we would like to know um, in order to make um, accurate um, uh, analyses on it. So, I mean, he mentions in his in his email, maybe as many as 800,000 Ukrainians. The numbers I've read are closer to 100,000 or 95,000. The reason we know that is as a Kremlin decree, an emergency decree was published that talked about evacuating 95,000 people and, and ensure their reception. Now, of course, 
what we don't know is whether these people are evacuated in inverted commas because, as I say, they are a perceived enemy elements within Russia, or, uh, within Ukraine, sorry, or whether actually these are considered friendly people um, in Ukraine and uh, they want to be, you know, safe um, from, uh, from, the, from the war, you know, so that then when the war is over, they can be sent back and can be used as uh, helpful um, tools of a Russian state, effectively. We just don't know. Um, but it is a very interesting um, point and one that I think actually does deserve further analysis because no doubt there is a lot of stories to be told and I'm sure that not all of them will be ones that will be very pleasant to hear. Thank you very much, Francis. Um, I believe we've come to the end of our time today. So, Francis, Verity and Dom, can I ask you for your final thoughts? Why, why don't we start with you, Dom? Yeah, I, well, it's, keep an eye on the Donbass. I mean, the, the idea that, that the phase phase two of the war has started there um, is is interesting. There's, there's some evidence for it, but it, it's a stuttering start if, if it is. The real thing to watch out for there is can Russia do any type of combined arms manoeuvre so linking infantry armour um, artillery engineers all, all the all the different parts of the orchestra together or do they do as we saw in north ukraine just drive down the road and uh, and and wait to get wait to get hit let's see uh, we've yet to see if this new uh, new general in charge is actually able to to come up with a different a different plan a different a different way of fighting uh, and we will that, that will play out in the donbass francis Turnley. Thanks, David. Um, I would just add on on what uh, Dom has just said there. I think the Donbass is is the is the place to watch and and and, and seeing uh, just the scale of 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 either what Russia is able to do differently or or perhaps seeing where what the the scale of the Ukrainian resistance and the use of some of these new weapons that we we were just discussing that they have been sent. Um, I think the the other thing that's relevant to this is. Um, just the, the, the keep coming back to this point about um, attrition rates. Uh, I've read some very interesting analysis that's been making the point that you know, if if, if Russia faces anything similar to the twenty percent attrition rates that they've been losing since this war started, then they will not be able to continue to fight. I mean, it's as serious as that beyond the end or sorry, the middle of of June. You know, they will actually be impossible for them to do so. And I know that that seems a hell of a long way away at present, given the horrors that are going on. But that's assuming the 20 percent rate. But if they are throwing everything at this, then it might get higher. It might get 30 percent. It might get even higher than that. And so, you know, the, with every every day would get reduced off that total of what it would be possible for um, for Russia to continue fighting. So as we were saying yesterday, May the 9th, this, 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 this significant date that we understand that Putin wants to have achieved successes by so that in the big red square parade, he has something to to show off for this conflict. I believe that they are really, really pushing strongly for that date because they know that they will not be able to continue this fight for, for, for too much longer um, in, in the grand scheme of things. And so I say I would watch the attrition rates very carefully and, and, and measure it up about against what the Ukrainians are losing. And of course, last point, it's much easier to defend than to attack in terms of when you're being concerned about attrition rates. Attrition rates are higher when you're on the offensive, which of course the Russians are. So that'll be another um, uh, benefit from the Ukrainian perspective. Brilliant. Thank you, Francis. And Verity, would you like the final word? Yeah, so I just wanted to pull out what Francis said about new weapons. You know, this is really something to keep an eye on as we see the siege of this steel plant continue. We don't know what the Russians are going to use yet to smoke these people out. And I think I just want to stress that this would be the biggest victory for Putin to date. It's key. It's the key to Mariupol and it's the key to this land corridor to Crimea. And we also need to be watching these humanitarian corridors. Are they going to work? You know, are we going to be getting any civilians out? So I think those are the two things to really keep an eye out for the rest of today and tomorrow. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first 30 days completely free at telegraph.co.uk forward slash audio or sign up to Dispatches, our daily Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so that you don't miss it. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app and leave a review as it helps others find the show. 
you can also get in touch directly with us by emailing podcasts at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells and Giles Gear, and on Twitter, Sophie Coe.